I am reading uh, from Word, where I tie two books that God dictated. And I'm uh, currently redoing the 50 videos I've been posting for a couple of years now. That they just don't have the quality they did at first. So we're going to go through the book again. So everything I'm reading to you comes from the book that God wrote. It's his books, not mine. He taught me the material, and then over months of time, he'd wake me up sometime and say, Keith, go to your computer, write this down, or type it. This is, uh, I've already put the introduction, and uh, Isaiah 53, the day of the Lord, we've already redone that one, that's how it starts, and uh, it's currently on YouTube. This is chapter one, the leper scholar. The oral tradition and the oral law are necessary for an understanding of the laws given to Moses by the Lord, such as how you keep and observe the Sabbath of Exodus, chapter 31, verse 16, must be determined in the oral tradition. Commentaries on the books of the Hebrew Bible outside of the teachings and laws that were given to Moses by God at Or in the Torah are opinions. And there were many disagreements among the sages and rabbis of the ancient age and the Middle Ages regarding the prophets and their books. Rabbi Shlomo Yishchaki, generally known today by the acronym Rashi, was a medieval French rabbi and author of a comprehensive commentary on the Talmud and commentary on the Tanakh. He is often referred to as the first rabbi to believe that the Jewish people, as one man, Israel, are God's righteous servant. The early sages expected a personal Messiah to fulfill the Isaiah prophecy. No alternative interpretation was applied to this passage until the Middle Ages. Rashi held that position that the servant passages of Isaiah referred to the collective faith of the nation of Israel rather than a personal Messiah. Some rabbis, such as Ibn Ezra and Kamichi, agreed, however. Many other rabbis, sages, during the same period and later, including Moses ben Maimon, commonly known to as Maimonides, and often referred to by the acronym Rambam, a medieval Sephardic Jewish philosopher who became one of the most prolific and influential Torah scholars of the Middle Ages, realized the inconsistencies of Rashi's views and would not abandon the original Messianic interpretations. Rashi's commentary on Isaiah chapter 52, 13 through 15, and 53 in its entirety, supporting his position, conflicts with his commentary on the book of Zechariah, chapter 1. When he says in his Midrash on this, this chapter, the prophecy of Zechariah is extremely enigmatic because it contains it contains visions resembling a dream that require an interpretation. We cannot ascertain the truth of this interpretation until the teacher of righteousness comes. 
Nevertheless, I will put my heart to re 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 reconciling the verses one by one according to the interpretation interpretations that resemble it in following the interpretation of Jonathan. The teacher of righteousness, Rashi awaits, is God's righteous servant of Isaiah 53. He's waiting for a personal Messiah. So, very inconsistent. He is referring to a particular man and not the people of Israel, which would include himself, by the way, and he can't get it done. Rashi is known for inconsistencies in his interpretation. Uh, there's a chapter on this in the book God dictated to me, Zechariah 1. And uh, he gave me the answer, and it's in the book. The teacher of righteousness has come. That would be me. And there is no question about it. God said he was going to return. He said when he was going to return. Jeremiah 31 makes it clear that it's this time. It is this time, and Malachi 3 makes it clear that God's coming back to place his temple amongst the Jewish people on Mount Zion. It does not have to be the Temple Mount, and I'm quite sure will not be. And he has returned, as he said he would, unlike Jesus, who five times prophesied when he would return, and every prophecy failed. There's also a chapter on that. God has covered everything, people. If you would read these books, and I'll show you how to get to them on the internet, they have not been published. Uh, they will be one day. Some of the first written interpretations are, or targums, ancient paraphrase on biblical texts. See Isaiah 53, as regard <coughs> referring to an individual servant, the Messiah, who would suffer. Messianic Jewish Talmudist Rachmel Fadiad recounts these early views. Here's one note. Our ancient commentaries with one accord noted that the context clearly speaks of God's anointed one, the Moshiach. From Isaiah 11, clearly. The aromatic translation of this chapter, according to Rabbi Jonathan ben Uzel, a disciple of Hillel, who lived early in the 2nd century CE, begins with the simple and worthy words. Behold, my servant Messiah shall prosper. He shall be high and increase and be exceedingly strong as the house of Israel looked to him through many days because their countenance was darkened amongst the peoples and their complexion beyond the sons of men. And there's a, a bracket, Targum, Jonathan on Isaiah 53, Ad Lucum. We find some interpretations in the Babylon Talmud. What is his, the Messiah's name? The rabbi said his name is the leper scholar. As it is written, surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him a leper, smitten of God and afflicted. That would be afflicted by God. And, and, and that means you're born disfigured. You're blind, lame, crippled, uh, just deformities. That's, that King David would have nothing to do with those kind of people because he, he knew, he thought he knew, that that meant God did not like this person. And he afflicted him in the womb. Okay, now we don't generally, there are some out there, but we don't generally believe in that today, that God does such a thing. Uh, there's just, that's just the human condition. It just happens. I was afflicted by God. 
He took my, he said, I put my friend, the finger of God in your mother's womb and I touched your breast and I removed it. I have no right breast. I have a shoulder, right shoulder, and my right arm is withered. But it doesn't have a lot of muscle to it. It works just fine. It's just not very strong. Similarly, in an explanation of Ruth, chapter 2, verse 14, in the Midrash, Rabba, it states, he is speaking of the King Messiah. Come hither, draw near to the throne, and dip thy morsel in this vinegar. This refers to the chastisements, as it is said, that he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The Zohar, in its interpretation of Isaiah 53, points to the Messiah as well. There is in the Garden of Eden a palace named the Palace of the Sons of Sickness. This place the Messiah enters and his, he summons every pain and every chastisement of Israel. And had he not thus lightened them upon himself, there had been no man able to bear Israel's chastisements for the transgressions of the law, as it is written, Surely our sickness he has carried. The rabbis today who believe Isaiah 53 describes the Jewish people as one man Israel have been left to their own analysis for this interpretation and there are different opinions on how the Jewish people fulfill the verse of Isaiah 53. Rabbi Tobias Singer of Outreach Judaism and Jews for Judaism both believe Isaiah 53 describes Israel and they disagree with each other in their analysis, their commentary in Midrash form. This is not unusual. Rabbi Nechamades often disagree with Rabbi Memonades. Bam, bam. Tobias Singer find the Christian belief that God sacrifices his children by applying the animal atonement and worship laws of the Torah in Leviticus to human beings. Yes, he does. The great anti-missionary Tobias Singer has told two billion Christians, it's okay to use Leviticus for your uh, for your lamb, as they call him. Because I'm using it for, for our people, the Jewish people, the six million murdered of the Holocaust. I think he's calling the righteous servant. It's hard to tell. I, really, his whole commentary is an absurdity. Uh, when he tells you 53 is Israel, and he's got 46,000 followers. And believe me, you know, if you say something different from him, their response is, that's not what Tobia says. Yeah, well, you better go check up on him. He's got a little Rambam in it. Rambam made up the Messianic era. Rambam made up the world will exalt the Jew. And he made a mistaken interpretation and said based on verses in the Hebrew Bible, that the world will speak Hebrew. That's not going to happen either. Jews for Judaism believes in this exaltation of the Jewish people following the teachings of the sages and rabbis on an era of redemption, restoration, and exaltation of the Jewish people. The opinions and disagreements on its interpretation of Isaiah 53 are not a case of interpreting a vague law of God given to Moses, whose meaning must be determined in the oral tradition to be properly observed. Those who believe Israel is a scribe and is God's righteous servant do not understand the importance of having a description 
of men prophesied to come in a future time. These men do not work miracles. In the laws concerning King Moshe of the Mishnah Torah, chapter 11, paragraph 3 provides, one should not entertain the notion that the King Moshe must work miracles and wonders, bring about new phenomena within the world, resurrect the dead, or perform any similar deeds. This is definitely not true. There is no King Moshe, by the way. Rambam has two chapters on the laws of King Moshe and the kingdom of King Moshe, and he made it all up. You know what you know what God calls the descendant of David? The twig of the shoot of the stump of Jesse from Isaiah eleven. He said, My servant David, a shepherd, a teacher. There's no King Moshe. Okay? You gotta watch these, you know, we, we, God wants antiquity left behind where it should be. And we're gonna bring this to the common era of science, medicine, knowledge, information, and, and, and be a, a religion that makes sense. You can't say the world's gonna worship you without thinking to yourself. That means two billion Christians are gonna disavow Jesus. Yeah, let's see somebody get that to happen without a miracle. Two billion Muslims are gonna disavow Allah as they know him. Yeah, sure. It cannot happen. And yet, they get on their videos and they teach this as though it, it's a done deal. Matter of fact, all of Jews for Judaism commentary on 53 is based on that world exaltation, an event that has not occurred, an event that will not occur, and an event that simply cannot occur. It's impossible. And yet, that's the basis for their commentary. So, Toby Singer is using the murder of the Holocaust, and I can't decide if Hitler sacrificed him and he became the righteous servant, or if this human sacrifices, rams, he called them, the murder of the Holocaust. He said that 5310 says guilt offering. No, it doesn't. He also made a mistake in his translation from Hebrew to English. It says exactly what it says in the JPS 1985 from scratch translation of Hebrew to English of the Leningrad Codex, the oldest Bible we have. They just started up. So this is what it says. And what it says is God chose to crush him with disease that he would offer himself for guilt. And somewhere in there, Tovia decided it, would, it meant guilt offering. Let's go to Leviticus, he says. So he revised God's animal sacrificial laws, which God did away with. He told his people, I don't want your animals anymore. And then he added human beings to, who does he think he is? Now God could do that. He could do it through me, his representation today, his prophet like Moses today, who has two covenants to deliver, by the way. Moses had delivered one. In other words, it's the same task. It has to be delivered to his people. And he has to have a man. God talks to one man at a time. There's an exception to that when he talked to Moses' his brother. But, and Moses at the same time for a while. And for one event, actually. But, uh, and that's because Moses had a problem uh, stuttering or stammering. Anyway, let me get back to it. The shortest verse in the Christian New Testament is Jesus wept. He had just raised Lazarus from the dead and still the people did not believe he was who he said he was. There is no description of him. 
It is certainly not Isaiah 53. He didn't fit anything in 53. Uh, it, it just, you know, it boggles the mind that this Christians can read 53 and say it's Jesus. He's exposed. He, first of all, Jesus wasn't crushed with a disease and exposed to death. It was a disease that's going to kill you. But God granted him long life. Jesus didn't get a long life. He died. He wasn't exposed to death. He died. And it says he shall see his children. Jesus didn't have children. I, I just don't understand it. He makes the many righteous by his knowledge, not by his blood, not by his death. It's by his knowledge. He becomes a teacher. That's David. He becomes the teacher. The teacher, the only teacher today God recognizes. And there's chapters on that. You'll find out about it. Judaism does not seem to realize how important a description of God's servant David is for the building of the third temple. Rambam says, if King Moshiach builds the third temple, we will know he's Moshiach. If he is not first recognized as God's righteous servant, this will not happen. If people aren't going to listen to him and decide, well, you have to read the proofs. God gave Moses three proofs. He's given me three proofs. But you got to go read it. Nobody's going to believe me on my words. You have to read what God had me taught. Because it is impossible, which means it was a miracle that they're there, for me to have that kind of knowledge. For me to have that kind of knowledge, I will have now become the most intelligent Jewish rabbi or sage, religious Jude, uh, Judaism theologian that has ever lived in the history of the Jews. That's what that book is full of. Judaism, you drop the ball here. And then it started rolling down the hill. You called it an avalanche of, of misinterpretations. Judaism. You didn't even see this. Judaism. On and on and on. And that's why I can't get them published. You send that to a Jewish publisher and they're just like, what is this? This is the kind of things we publish. <laughs> but with a little help, a little endorsement, we'll get there because of the two covenants don't go into effect. And remember, God wrote this. He wrote it into a chapter. They do not go into effect until those books are published, giving all the Jewish people of the world the opportunity to read it. The proof. Don't make up your mind until you read the proof. And, of course, you're listening to it right now. I'm putting uh, Isaiah 53 in the day of the Lord. Uh, I'm redoing it uh, on YouTube. And this is the first chapter. Now, I've already started with the introduction and an analysis of, of Isaiah 53. If Elijah is not recognized, his purpose in clearing the way for the Lord to return to his temple, and in 53, the righteous servant chapter, it is said a purpose which might prosper. And I said, why would you say might prosper? He said they might not recognize Elijah and he can't get it done. Okay, if Elijah is not recognized, his purpose to clear the way for the Lord's return to his temple will not prosper, and God will bring utter destruction. His last words in Malachi 3, if you don't build this temple, he will bring utter destruction to the land, Israel. He means his creation will. God is absolute power, absolute knowledge, and his creation. That's how he describes himself. He's saying, basically, the Middle East is going to all get together and come down on Israel at one time. Yeah, you know, nuclear bombs from Iran, I don't know. But it's going to happen. But if the temple's there, God says they're going to shy away from it. If they believe there's a chance God is actually in there, that's your salvation. Because one of the covenants, the other co one covenant, sin forgiveness. Sin forgiveness. So, you, so that the Jewish people are holy seed to build a third temple. He did the same thing for the exiles in the book of Isaiah. 
the gate of sins and all their inequities. He says it's not for y'all. <laughs> and they went on, became a holy seed, and went on to build a second temple. Well, we got another temple to build. And he's here, so he's come back. And you don't want other destruction. I mean, what a choice. Covenant of Friendship says, I'm placing my temple amongst you. You will never be defeated and dispersed again. That doesn't mean you won't have wars, but you'll never be defeated. I mean, that's your choice. Build the temple, never defeat it. Don't build it, utter destruction to Israel. Now, why aren't your rabbis teaching that? Except messianic era, there will be no pain. All men will be to worship God. I got plenty on I got Rambam's with his rendition on it that they keep repeating. And I got what God says. Covenant of friendship. He just says the lands will bloom again. You'll no longer be the taunts of nations. And I will place my temple amongst you. That's it. And believe me, that's plenty. World exaltation. The Jews weren't made for world exaltation. And God says every one of them is going to go through the Jewish experience. Nobody catches a break. It's part of the Jewish heaven that he's making. He wants every Jew up there in this new heaven he's creating. It's new because there's going to be a new host of angels at judgment time. That host of angels, the people Israel. You're basically angelic once you die. You can't really do a whole lot of sinning. I know all about that heaven. I've been there in vision so many times. He's taught me up there. He's taught me in the temple. In vision. Anyway. The prophet like Moses will write the words of God as Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, at the command and direction of God. Orthodox Jews commonly believe that Torah from heaven is the central tenet of the Jewish religion. In orthodox circles, it is understood to mean that God dictated the entire text of the first five books of the Bible to Moses, who then wrote it down. If he is not recognized, no one will know that what is written is Scripture, the written word of God. These two books that I have is scripture. It's not canonized. It's not the Bible. But the scrolls weren't either when written. But they were scripture. It's divinely received. God says, write this down. You're a prophet when you speak with God. Again, he really only talks to one man at a time. And uh, there's plenty of information on that and why. Uh, even the sages wondered. Did Moses hear God through his ear? We don't know. And the answer is no. But I'm not going to get into all that right now. There are many unknowns in the teachings of the sages and rabbis of the ancient age. And God's righteous servant makes the many righteous by his knowledge and long life. The knowledge is given to him during the test of devotion, which is in 53, you just can't see it. <clears throat> you find it in the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel is the key to 53 because he goes through the same fire of fire, uh, God changing a man's temperament, his emotions, teaching him. Ezekiel went through the same thing. He matches many of the verses by Isaiah 53. And... Uh, and God lets, lets some things out, such as this test of devotion. Nobody's supposed to be able to figure it out. He didn't want anybody to figure out, nobody ever has, until now. The only person who can explain it properly is the righteous servant, and that would be me. And I'm doing it 